In this second video of several which directly aim to show the truth about the Christmas tradition, we will be looking at several of the most prominent symbols associated with Christmas. Firstly, what about the name itself? What does the word Christmas even mean? Christmas is actually two separate words, and each needs to be defined on their own, so the first part is Christ. The Christ part of Christmas is obvious, as it is the title of our Lord and Savior. He is the promised Messiah. Now, we have to define the word Mass in Christ Mass. Since this is a Roman Catholic word, let's go to the Catholic Encyclopedia to find our definition. In the Christian law, the supreme sacrifice is that of the Mass. The supreme act of worship consists essentially in an offering of a worthy victim to God, the offering made by a proper person as a priest, the destruction of the victim. In short, the word mass means destruction of the victim, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia. Another way of understanding it is like this. The Catholic Church believes they are sacrificing Jesus Christ over and over again when they partake in the unbiblical Eucharist. They believe that Jesus must die over and over again because they do not believe his sacrifice on Calvary was sufficient. However, the word says that Jesus died once for our sins. Romans 6.10 For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Hebrews 7.27 Who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. Hebrews 9.12 Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9.26 For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9.28 So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 10.10 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So what about the term Merry Christmas? Well, Mary is defined as being full of high-spirited gaiety, jolly, delightful, or entertaining. The word Mary is defined to mean great happiness and joy. So when people say Merry Christmas, they are proclaiming their joy about the death of Jesus Christ. And though the great majority of people do not realize this fact, they are nonetheless declaring joy at his death. As a side note, when Santa Claus says ho 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 Merry Christmas, he is openly and boldly mocking the sacrifice of Christ with laughter. The Mass is the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary's cross. Christ, through the ministry of the Roman Catholic priest, offers himself to God in an unbloody manner under the appearances of bread and wine. Christ is thus crucified afresh, obviously indicating his death on Calvary was insufficient. The Mass is the same sacrifice as the sacrifice of the cross because the victim is the same. The purpose of the Mass is, among other things, to satisfy the justice of God for the sins committed against him. When the priest pronounces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens and brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon the Roman Catholic altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. Christ became incarnate a single time. The priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on the Roman Catholic altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man not once, but a thousand times. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal, omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. No wonder that the name which spiritual writers are especially fond of applying to the priest is that of Altar Christus, for the priest is, and should be, another Christ. There should be no doubt in anyone's mind that all the faithful ought to show to this most holy sacrament, the communion wafer, the worship which is due to the true God, as has always been the custom of the Catholic Church. Nor is it to be adored any the less because it was instituted by Christ to be eaten. What about the date, December 25th? Luke 2, 8-11 And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And, lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. As I mentioned in my first video in this series, the shepherds would not have been taking their flocks out in winter, especially at night. According to the information that can be gathered about the area of Palestine, the flocks were led out to pasture between March and November. The rest of the time they were indoors. This proves plainly that the flocks were not yet brought home from their pastures when the angels visited the shepherds. Some have the idea that there is no winter in Palestine, but that is a mistake, because sometimes it is very cold there, so that the lives of both men and beasts are in danger of the cold rain and hailstorms of the winter. Concerning this, Adam Clark makes the following remark in his commentary. It was a custom among the Jews to send out their sheep to the desert about the Passover and bring them home at the commencement of the first rain. The first rain occurred around the Jewish month of Sheshvan, that is around October to November to us. So, you see the flocks were brought in well before December 25th. If those who claim Christ Lord would place their faith in his infallible word, there would be a lot less pagan traditions being celebrated as a whole, but most especially in the Christian world. The pastors are at fault here. Satan has placed his wolves in sheep's clothing before the people and tricked them all into believing that a pagan celebration has something to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. The ultimate goal is to get people out of their Bibles, because Satan knows that eternal life is found in the scriptures. John 5.39 Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The 25th of December is supposed to be the day of the birth of Jesus Christ, and its observance has become customary and popular. But yet there is no certainty that we are keeping the veritable day of our Savior's birth. History gives us no certain assurance of this. The Bible does not give us the precise time. Had the Lord deemed this knowledge essential to our salvation, he would have spoken through his prophets and apostles that we must know all about the matter. But the silence of the scriptures upon this point evidences to us that it is hidden from us for the wisest purposes. In his wisdom, the Lord concealed the place where he buried Moses. God buried him and God resurrected him and took him to heaven. This secrecy was to prevent idolatry. For the very same purpose, he has concealed the precise day of Christ's birth, that the day should not receive the honor that should be given to Christ as the Redeemer of the world, one to be received, to be trusted, to be relied on, as he who could save to the uttermost all who come unto him. The soul's adoration should be given to Jesus as the Son of the infinite God. There is no divine sanctity resting upon the 25th of December, and it is not pleasing to God that anything that concerns the salvation of man through the infinite sacrifice made for them should be so sadly perverted from its professed design. Christ should be the supreme object, but as Christmas has been observed, the glory is turned from him to mortal man whose sinful, defective character made it necessary for him to come to our world. Acts 17, 29 to 31. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. At the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Even Christmas, the day observed professedly in the honor of the birthday of Christ, has been made a most effective means of turning the mind away from Christ, away from his glory. Please excuse me on the next uh, couple quotes, because there are going to be words that I butcher. Christmas, the supposed anniversary of the birth of Jesus Christ, occurring on December 25th, no sufficient data exists for the determination of the month or the day of the event. There is no historical evidence that our Lord's birthday was celebrated during the apostolic or early post-apostolic times. The uncertainty that existed at the beginning of the third century in the minds of Hippolytus and others, Hippolytus earlier favored January 2nd, Clement of Alexandria, the 25th day of Passion, which is May 20th for us, while others, according to Clement, fixed upon April 18th or 19th and March 28th proves that no Christmas festival had been established much before the middle of the century. January 6th was earlier fixed upon as the date of the baptism or spiritual birth of Christ, and the Feast of Epiphany was celebrated by the 
uh, Basilidian Gnostics in the second century, and by Catholic Christians uh, by about the beginning of the fourth century. The earliest record of the recognition of December 25th as a church festival is in the Philokalian calendar. A star cult, sun worship, became in the third century AD the dominant official creed, paving the road for the ultimate triumph of Judeo-Christian monotheism. So strong was the belief in the invincible sun, Sol Invictus, that, for example, Constantine I, himself at first a devotee of the sun cult, found it indeed perfectly compatible with his pro-Christian sympathies to authorize his own portrayal as Helios. And in 354, the ascendant Christian church in the region of his pious but unsavory son, Constantius II, found it prudent to change the celebration of the, verse of the birth of Jesus from the traditional date of January 6th to December 25th in order to combat the pagan sun god's popularity, his birthday being December 25th. The reasons for celebrating our major feasts when we do are many and varied. In general, however, it is true that many of them have at least an indirect connection with the pre-Christian feasts celebrated about the same time of year, feasts entering around the harvest, the rebirth of the sun at the winter solstice, and the renewal of nature in spring, and so on. Did early Christians celebrate Christmas? Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. The first evidence of the feast is from Egypt. Pagan customs entering around the January calendars gravitated to Christmas. In the scriptures, no one is recorded to have kept a feast or held a great banquet on his birthday. It is only sinners who make great rejoicings over the day in which they were born into the world. And to settle some minds out there that place no stock in any boast of Catholicism, the Roman Church is not the only one that understands this simple historic fact. A broad element of English Christianity still considered Christmas celebration a pagan blasphemy. The Puritans, Baptists, Quakers, Presbyterians, Calvinists, and other denominations brought this opposition to early New England, and strong opposition to the holiday lasted in America until the middle of the 18th century. Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. Christmas, it was, according to many authorities, not celebrated in the first centuries of the Christian church, as the Christian usage in general was to celebrate the death of remarkable persons. A feast was established in memory of this event, the birth of Jesus, in the fourth century. In the fifth century, the Western church ordered it to be celebrated forever on the day of the old Roman feast of the birth of Sol, who is the son, as no certain knowledge of the day of Christ's birth existed. Since there is no evidence for the observance of Christmas in the Bible, the questions arise, what is its origin, and when did its celebration begin? Lector P. Walsdenstrom says, the custom to celebrate the birth of Christ in the last part of December began first in the 4th century. Before that, the 6th of January was celebrated. How much the date of the festival depended upon the pagan Brumalia, December 25th, following the Saturnalia, December 17th to the 24th, and celebrating the shortest day of the year and the new sun cannot be accurately determined. The pagan Saturnalia and Brumalia were too deeply entrenched in popular custom to be set aside by Christian influence. The pagan festival with its riot and merrymaking was so popular that Christians were glad of an excuse to continue its celebration with little change in spirit and in manner. Christian preachers of the West and the Near East protested against the unseemly frivolity with which Christ's birth was celebrated, while Christians of Mesopotamia accused their Western brethren of idolatry and sun worship for adopting as Christian this pagan festival. Within the Christian church, no such festival as Christmas was ever heard of till the 3rd century, and not till the 4th century was far advanced did it gain much observance. How then? did the Romish church fix on December 25th as Christmas Day. Why, thus, long before the 4th century, and long before the Christian era itself, a festival was celebrated among the heathen at that precise time of the year in honor of the birth of the son of the Babylonian Queen of Heaven. And it may fairly be presumed that, in order to conciliate the heathen, and to swell the number of the nominal adherents of Christianity, the same festival was adopted by the Roman Church, giving it the name of Christ. The Origin of Gift-Giving 
The interchange of presents between friends is a like characteristic of Christmas and the Saturnalia, and must have been adopted by Christians from the pagans, as the admonition of Tertullian plainly shows. What is the actual reason and purpose for this pagan infiltration into Christianity? Ellen White put it best. This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin, foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. The giving of the presents was a Roman custom. The Yule Tide and the Yule Log are remnants of old Teutonic nature worship. The Pagan Christmas Tree The Christmas tree, now so common among us, was equally common in pagan Rome and pagan Egypt. In Egypt it was the palm tree. In Rome it was the fir. The palm tree denoting the pagan messiah as Baal Tamer, the fir referring to him as Baal Bereth. The mother of Adonis, the sun god and great mediatorial divinity, was mystically said to have been changed into a tree, and when in that state to have brought forth her divine son. If the mother was a tree, the son must have been recognized as man of the branch, and this entirely accounts for putting the Yule log into the fire on Christmas Eve as the appearance of the Christmas tree the next morning. As Zero Ashta, the seed of the woman, he has to enter the fire on Mother Night that he may be born the next day out of it as the branch of God or the tree that brings divine gifts to men. The divine child born at the winter solstice was born as a new incarnation of the great God after that God had been cut in pieces on purpose to revenge his death upon his murderers. Now the great God, cut off in the midst of his power and glory, was symbolized as a huge tree, stripped of all his branches, and cut down almost to the ground. But the great serpent, the symbol of the life-restoring Aesculapius, twists itself around the dead stalk, and, lo, at its side sprouts a young tree, a tree of an entirely different kind, that is never to be cut down by a hostile power and thus shadowed forth the perpetuity and everlasting nature of his power, how that after having fallen before his enemies, he has risen triumphant over them all. Therefore, the 25th of December, the day that was observed in Rome as the day when the victorious God reappeared on earth, was held at the Natalis Invicti Solis, the birthday of the unconquered sun. Yuletide and Yule Log The Yule Log tradition comes to us from Scandinavia, where the pagan sex and fertility god Yule, or Yule, was honored in a 12-day celebration in December. A large single log, generally considered to have been a phallic idol, was kept with a fire against it for 12 days, a different sacrifice to Yule being offered in the fire on each of the 12 days. The Yule log was originally an entire tree, carefully chosen and brought into the house with great ceremony. The butt end would be placed into the hearth while the rest of the tree stuck out into the room. The tree would be slowly fed into the fire and the entire process was carefully timed to last the entire Yule season. This is where the 12 days of Christmas originated, which are now counted as the 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany, which is January 6th. Yuletide, meaning the turning of the sun or the winter solstice, has traditionally been a time of extreme importance in Scandinavia, a time when fortunes for the coming year were determined and when the dead were thought to walk the earth. For a long time, it was considered dangerous to sleep alone on Christmas Eve. The extended family, master and servant alike, would sleep together on a freshly spread bed of straw. The mistletoe. Among the pre-Christian Druidic superstitions derived from ancient Babylon was the legend of the mistletoe. It was regarded as a divine branch which came down from heaven and grafted itself into an earthly tree. Thus, the mistletoe became a token of reconciliation the kiss being a symbol of pardon. All this proves very plainly that number one, that the birth of Christ was not universally celebrated by the Christians during the first three centuries. Number two, that it was the Latin church which first ordained it to be celebrated on the 25th of December. Number three, that it was Julius I, Bishop of Rome, who made the appointment. And number four, that the customs at this old pagan festival were transferred to Christmas, this is truly surprising. Here are indeed reasons for a solemn search of heart, fervent prayer, and firmness of character for those who wish to be pure in the sight of God. Who's to blame for all this pagan infiltration? 
So, who do we have to thank for all this pagan infiltration in our lives? Rome. Now, don't take my word for it. Rome admits this very fact. Cardinal Newman admits in his book that the temples, incense, oil lamps, votive offerings, holy water, holidays, and seasons of devotion, processions, blessings of the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure of priests, monks, and nuns, images, and statues are all of pagan origin. With such boldness and such arrogance, it's as if the devil is puffing up his chest to proclaim to God himself that, yes, they know it's against your will, yet they choose it over you anyway. I hope and pray that you are blessed by everything you heard here today. God bless.